Good evening. I'm calling to order the meeting of the Analytical School Committee uh, on Thursday, December 16th, 2021. I am Bill Hainer, the chair. Permit me to confirm that all members of persons anticipated in the agenda are present and can hear me. When I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Here. Uh, Ms. Morgan. Here. And I'll get back to the others as they come in. Dr. Holman. Here. Uh, Dr. McNeil. Here. Mr. Spiegel. Here. Mr. Mason. Ms. Elmer. Here. Uh, Arlington Educational Association representative, Ms. Keyes. Here. And student representative, Megan Carmody. Here. Thank you. Tonight's meeting of the Arlington School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with an act signed into law on June 16th, 2021 that extends certain COVID-19 measures adopted during the state of emergency. The act includes an extension until April 1st, 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law. The governor's order, which is referenced with agenda materials on the town's website for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Before we begin, permit me to offer a few notes. First, this meeting is being conducted via Zoom. It's being recorded and also being simultaneously broadcast on ACMI. Persons wishing to join the meeting by Zoom may find information on how to do so on the town's website. Persons participating by Zoom are reminded that they may be visible to others and that if they wish to participate, you are asked to provide your full name in the interest of developing a record of the meeting. All participants are advised that people may be listening who do not provide comment, and those persons are not required to identify themselves. Both Zoom participants and persons watching on ACMI can follow the proposed posted agenda materials also found on the town's website using Novus Agenda platform. And finally, each vote tonight will be taken by roll call vote. Uh, I'm Mr. Cardin, would you verify that you're present? Yes, thank you. And I don't see anyone else. Mr. Hayner, Dr. Allison Ampey also was not sent the link, but I sent it to her and then she needs, she's going to need to be promoted from the okay. attendees list when she gets here. Okay. And I asked Ms. Diggins to send it also to uh, Mr. Schlickman. Okay. Next item, public participation. For members of the public who wish to address the committee, there will be 30 minutes of public comment. Depending on the number of people who sign up, time allotments may be reduced but will not exceed three minutes each. If the number of people who sign up exceeds what can be done in 30 minutes, the number of speakers will be capped and will be invited to speak based on the timestamp of their email to Ms. Diggins. The school committee respectfully requests participants of the public to utilize their camera, if possible, while speaking and to adhere to the public comment policy, BEDH, that requires participants to provide their name and address. Speakers may offer such sub objective criticism of the school operations and programs as concern them, but in public session, the committee will not hear personal complaints about school personnel nor against any member of the school community, except for the school committee or the superintendent in their capacity as the operational leader of the Arlington Public Schools. Additionally, the committee will not hear anything that may identify or infringe upon a student's privacy by name or incident. If you would like to sign up to speak, please email ediggins at arlington.k12.ma.us by 12 noon on the date of the meeting. I've been informed no one uh, of the public has signed up to speak. The next item uh, on the agenda is uh, Arlington High School student representative, Ms. Comedy. Do you have anything to share with us tonight? Um, yes, I have a few things to share. Um, so next week at the high school, we'll be doing a holiday spirit week just to get everyone into the holiday spirit and sort of boost morale before we go on break. And then as well, the student council is very excited to be bringing back the Battle of the Bands this year, which will be happening on January 28th at 7 p.m. at the region and everyone in the Arlington community is welcome to join. Thank you very much. The next item is budget requests. Dr. Holman. Good evening, members of the school committee, um, all of the leaders who have joined us and as well as uh, Juliana Keys and um, everybody watching at home. We have uh, shared with the school committee a, requ a budget request report, which has listed in the report 
Um, all of the requests that have come to us from our leadership, as well as from the AEA. I want to thank everybody for putting in thoughtful budget requests this year and developing rationales and sharing the data that supports those requests and some of their reasoning for those requests. I also want to thank Michael Mason, um, our CFO, who has spent countless hours uh, with me and on his own developing the report for all of you so that it would be in a format that is uh, readable and hopefully um, understandable. We have all of our leaders here to answer any specific questions from the committee about the report. And that is so that if you have specific questions that myself or Mr. Mason are unable to answer with specificity, one of our leaders can jump in and help clarify what that request was about. Uh, we've spent many hours over the last several weeks um, assessing the needs of the district. We have organized these requests according to the five-year budget plan that the school committee developed. Um, and that is posted to the district's website from 2019. We organized the requests according to that plan and also aligned them. Those the requests that were not explicitly in the plan, so positions that were not explicitly listed as part of that five-year plan, we aligned with the categories in the plan. So um, there were categories related to closing the achievement gap, to improving instruction, um, to enrollment, and we tried to align any additional requests with those categories. It also includes major supply and equipment requests that would require us to increase departmental or school budgets. Um, and it is evident from the report, I hope that the co committee and community can tell that there are many needs that have risen to our attention as a result of the pandemic and many exciting initiatives that would benefit our students and our schools. And that over the next several weeks, as we develop a proposed budget for the school committee, we are going to need to prioritize requests um, in our planning and make some decisions about what it is is most important for us as we look forward to next school year. So with that said, I'd like to leave as much time and space as possible for questions from the committee. Um, is Mr. Mason here? He was... Yes, I'm here. All right, so we are ready to answer any questions that the committee has. And if we need to pass something off to one of our leaders who have taken the time to be with us this evening, we will do so. Before we do that, I just want to welcome Mr. Schlickman. We had a little uh, hiccup in getting everybody in. So uh, begin with any of the members of the committee uh, have any questions or comments they'd like to make. Ms. Morgan. Is, is Novus working for anybody or is it just me that it's not working for? Just me? Everybody else is in Novus? Awesome. Okay, thank you. Making me nervous. You're all, you're all. Okay. Uh, welcome, Dr. Ampi. Uh, just came into you. Uh, we had a little hiccup in connecting. So do you have a question on the budget, Dr. Ampi? Yeah, I have a few questions and comments. Go right ahead. Um, okay, so my questions first. Um, item number 43 is a teacher who is to be the internship coordinator. I think this is currently stipended. Is this included? I mean, is the stipend rolled into this or how does that work? Um, I'm going to defer that to Dr. Jenger, who can explain how this is currently organized and what the increase is. Are you here, Dr. Jenger? I am. I am. I didn't think I'd be the first person called on, but um, so the internship program right now is a 0.2 position. Um, it has gotten up to, in the past few years, about 60, um, a little over 60 students, participants. We have always thought that when we got to about 80, um, that we would need to expand the position to be a 0.4. Um, at the moment, also as a result of COVID, we've shifted for just this year, the internships to the spring. So actually the internship coordinator will be um, setting folks up for next fall at the same time as she's supervising the students who are in internships this spring. But our long-term goal is to expand the program to be year round and to have a larger work study and paid internship component. And in order to do those two things, we feel that we need to expand the position to a point four. Great, thanks. Um, then the next question is on, on item number 46, the coordinator. I'm just wondering what that person does. It's the elementary level of mathematics. Thank you. I will defer that one to Matthew Coleman. Are you here? 
Um, so essentially, can you just uh, clarify which lines they were? It's it's item number 46. Yep. It's and it's math, here, sorry. Yeah, the, the math intervention is for Bishop and Dom. Yeah. No, so this essentially, is the coordinator. Oh, coordinator. Oh, sorry. Thank you. So essentially, um, as it is right now, the uh, elementary math program is expanding. We have coaches at every uh, program. Mm -hmm. We have interventionists now. Uh, part of one of the items, I didn't hear the, the first part. Part of one of the items also was uh, an expansion of the intervention program as well. So essentially, it's getting to the point where for me to oversee and for me to feel as though I'm doing a um, a good job just in terms of thinking about the restructuring and having a little bit more consistent oversight over all of the program to give it a little bit more attention. Uh, for me right now, I'm also working with computer science um, as well with six through 12 um, and intervention in uh, six through nine as well. So it's just uh, having a little bit more oversight and a little more coordination. Okay, great, thank you. And then my final question on the items is on number 58 the registrar. Mm -hmm. um, I thought we already had one or I, I'm confused. Yeah. So we do have a district registrar. We have um, increased some of the expectations of those roles. I know we don't have um, Patricia Shepard, who is our town CIO on tonight, but we do have Dan um, Sheehan, I believe. Are you there, Dan? There's so many of you. I am here. Okay, I don't know if you can help us speak to that one, Dan. It'd be helpful. Um, it's it's an increased workload um, in the registration office and a shifting of some of the responsibilities, but uh, it's more um, parent interaction that's taking place in this office. So this is to help out with that and help it run more efficiently. Okay, so then we we'd end up having two. Yes. Okay. Okay. I will. Um, I will add to that, that this would add um, the additional support needed sometimes when families need a lot of interaction with the registration office in order to understand what documentation they're missing, um, to be supported with the language that they need the materials in, or if they need us to get some interpretation in to help them work through all of the documentation required. It could help with uh, coordinating screening when we have students who might need to be screened um, or might need additional community resources. So we have had more families, um, as I understand it this year, who required a little bit more one-on-one -on -one support as they got registered. And this would provide that support as well as support when we launch registration at the start of the registration process to make sure that all families know to register, that we can station registration support out at schools when we do K registration. Um, this would just enable us to have a lot more um, personnel behind that work. Okay, thank you. And then I have three quick comments. Um, first, going forward as we as you plan the actual budget, it'd be helpful to have an understanding of what the totals are with the additions that you're proposing. Um, and especially a model of the total elementary school desired staffing and some assessment of where the different schools lie in terms of fulfilling this model. Um, and it'd also be nice to have um, IT in at some place, you know, potentially to budget or something, just to explain what they're staffing. It, it seems like there's some restructuring or, or you know, big increases here, and I'd like to understand what the plan is and, and the rationale is behind it. And then finally, I just, I appreciate that we're adding the coaches and that this is helping the teachers teach our students better and helping the instruct, helping improve instruction. But I'm also just wondering, how, how do we know it's working? Um, and it, what metrics we have that we can point at just because, you know, down the road, we're gonna have to justify everything we ask for either to the town, manager and, and um, the finance committee for our budget requests or ultimately potentially an override at some point. And we need, it is very helpful for us when we do this to not just be able to say that this helps, but also have clear 
identifiable metrics in which we show improvement and, and that this improvement is continuing. So that's all my questions. Sorry to take so long. Thanks. Thank you. Any other member of the committee have a comment or question? Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Mr. Hainer. Um, <clears throat> so my question is, so I just want to make sure I get our, our process right. Tonight, you're sharing the preliminary FY23 positions. We're going to vote on it in March. As of right now, there's 38.4 new FTEs, about $2.5 million of expenses. Um, <clears throat> can you, so it, it, as new initiatives are developed, I'm thinking about some of the school improvement plans, it's possible that 38.4 number could change, right? It could be, you, got, you could think about it by March and say, we've got to add, we've got to either add two or three more FTEs or subtract something we have here and add something new. That's, that's your kind of time frame. Yeah. Um, so you're looking at the new positions requested line, right? For that two yeah. million that you're seeing. Yeah. yeah. So for clarity, what we're doing tonight is just showing you all of the requests that came in. Everything all the that people came in. have identified as needs. And we didn't, we we did our best not to leave any of them off. Some of them were duplicates, like we would hear the same from multiple people. Okay. Um, and we didn't duplicate them here. So we're trying to show you everything that has been identified as a need by our team. Okay. And we have not accounted for things like uh, efficiencies. If there are places where we can make reductions, I will be honest that not a lot of those have risen to the surface. Um, or, and we, know, we have not also identified some things that may come out of a grant. For example, the DEI specialist, if you recall, was actually embedded in our ESSER three uh, mm -hmm. planning for next year. So some of the, these expenses may not be true expenses to the general fund, but they are requests that came in. And from here, we need to prioritize what we can actually um, place into the budget based on what we're expecting uh, to have as an increase to the school budget for next year. So okay. this is very preliminary. And yep. if the school committee has thoughts on um, directions that they would like us to shift priorities um, or after a hearing with the community, additional thoughts on that, that's what we're happy to hear. Okay, great. My, my Thank you for clarifying that. My second question is, um, <clears throat> Of the positions listed, are there any that have been identified as 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 the potential to be funded by a grant or ARPA funds or something else? Like, do you look at this and say, "Oh, we can get this covered by something"? Yes, um, the DEI specialist K to twelve and the and an additional literacy coach for elementary would, that would have us uh, with enough literacy coaches for building based literacy coaches. Um, are both slated for ESSER 3 for the following school year. Uh, Mr. Mason, do we have any others that were included that were grant? Um, not, no, I don't believe that we did include anything else that would grant besides those two, two roles. Um, and I'm not, I'm not versed enough, well enough tonight to know if there are any other possible grant opportunities for the positions on this list. And okay, thank you. And then, Dr. Holman, I just like I want to understand just uh, uh, the process that you 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 use a process internally in which you and your department heads and principals will meet and discuss some of these and then prioritize them yourselves based on needs in the district and our input. Mm -hmm. Okay. And your timeline for doing that is January, February, or so. Mostly January, because I believe our deadline for having a proposed budget to you is the beginning of February. It is, that's right. Okay, I just wanted that clarification. Hope that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Hi, thank you, Mr. Hainer. Um, this is I. my question. So the, um, the senior custodial ground position, the mental health assessment and outreach coordinator and the CNAs aren't on here. Can somebody remind me? I, I, I'm sure it's correct that they're not here, but I just can't remember what we agreed to do with those folks. Mr. Mason. Yeah, so those positions are not on this list because those are being currently held in the current budget and they will be rolled over um, and carried forward in the fiscal 23 budget. 
Okay. For some reason, I thought that we had said that we were going to talk about them within the context of the FY23 budget, but I'm, I'm fine. I mean, at, as long as they're contained within the budget um, as they are, that's, that's fine. Um, the other thing that I didn't see in here were any reserve positions. Um, it looks like there are some enrollment increase positions, um, but I'm used to seeing reserve positions. I'm cool if there aren't going to be any, that's fine. Um, but that was something that I, I, I usually see that and I don't. So that's, I, so that's my next question. And then I have another one too. Um, that would be, I suppose, a request from me that we would factor into the proposed budget that we would uh, present to the school committee in February. So, no, I haven't requested it as part of the requests report, but as we get a better handle on what our enrollment projections will be, I'll have a better sense of how many reserve positions we may want to include in what, how we structure the proposed budget. Got it. Um, so then my next question is, so Line 17, the ELA coach, um, school TBD is fine. Is line 17 under closing the achievement gap and line 23, the math coach at Bishop, are those, and that's a 0.5, are those just in separate sections because the ELA coach was in the five-year plan and the 0.5 math coach wasn't or like, I'm just wondering, like, they look the same to, like, they look like the same thing to me, but I, I'm curious why they're in different, under different headings. Mr. Mason. That was probably a simple mistake on my part and mm -hmm. will be corrected going forward. Okay. So you think that that math person, that math coach is probably, I mean, I didn't look at, I didn't reconcile this with the five-year plan guys. So I don't know. Um, so we're thinking that person was in the five-year plan and we just need to move them up. No, what I'm, what I'm saying is that, uh, I, I guess I misunderstood your, your question. So the, the, math, the, the math coach that's below in the new position requested was not included in the five-year plan when we reconciled. Okay. So that is indeed correct. If you're looking at the subcategory, I was actually responding to your close achievement gap versus enrollment is actually oh, I see. the okay. category. Got it. Okay. And then I wanted to second um, Dr. Allison Ampey's question. I've, I've lost the plot on these coaches. Um, I don't know where we have them or how many. I don't know how many we want to have. Um, so um, it would be helpful to know what the goal is and then how far we've made it toward that goal, right? So I see, like, let's say, <laughs> I mean, let's say we got to hire all 38 of these people. <laughs> and then, so if we got all of these people, how far would we be at, at getting whatever the vision is for the number of these folks we're gonna have in each building, that would be really helpful for me to understand what the um, what the goal is. And then I see new coaches, right? So now I see an ESL coach, um, which I don't think I've seen before, um, which is interesting. Um, I guess actually, I I I I think that I thought that I saw Ms. Brzezzi here. Is she here? I'm here. If she, I'm here. She, can, can, can I can I just say something before we begin? And By all I, means. I would like to have um, Matt Coleman, who also has coaches in the math department. Um, uh, Mr. Cochran couldn't make it here. Um, Dr. Hoyo is here, so she can talk about the vision for coaches in the science department. And I just want to I just want to give this one plug. When we were during the pandemic, when we were shut down. The coaches um, were the ones, the primary ones who provided the learning plans to all teachers across the district and helped to implement the instructional model between hybrid and asynchronous. So when we had kids that were out uh, during those days, so when we were split with that hybrid model, the coaches were integral in providing curriculum. So as you, as you think about the different impact that, it, that they've had on instruction, I just want to util utilize that as a prime example. And that actually helped to alleviate some of the pressure that teachers had with coming up with curriculum. So I'm going to uh, let go ahead and let Ms. Bersese, uh talk about her vision for the ESL uh, coach for the district. And then I would like each one of the 
curriculum leaders to also talk about the impact and their vision for their departments. Um, I This is the SEI coaching that I placed into the budget for the district is, is new. It, it wasn't in the five-year plan. And the reasoning behind that um, is that Working with teachers across the district, I'm trying to develop an infrastructure of the English language learner department because currently it's myself and then teachers in the building. And with the um, impact of enrollment at the school level, there's, no, there's not enough time in the day to kind of work with gen ed teachers in the push-in model and getting in, in inclusion in the classrooms. So um, I've had experience in working in other districts where the SEI coach really um, can provide some changes with working with the teacher for four or five weeks on SEI strategies and impact the learning in the classroom and then um, going on to an, uh, another teacher. So the reasoning behind that, I, I surveyed the team, the ELL team, and I worked with Dr. Um, McNeil as well on this. I'm trying to see how we can best service our students that are in the gen ed classroom through the inclusion model. Um, and as well as the, our, our team of teachers where I think we're at, like, I could ask, I could get the exact percentage, but we're at like almost 98, 99%, all of our teachers are SEI endorsed. But when I go around to the schools and talk to teachers, they're feeling that they, they're not using those strategies that they learned in the retail and the SEI endorsement. So having a coach will be able to actually provide more professional development in district for teachers. I don't know if that answered your question, Jane, but that was kind of the vision. That helps. Yeah, thank you. Uh, next up, uh, Matt Coleman. Mr. Coleman, can you speak about the impact on your department? I can, yeah. Thanks all. Um, one aspect uh, just to consider and also just to give a little context. I think the district is also aware that we are investing a lot in coaching. And for this year, we are working with a consultant to actually coordinate and actually bring, I think, a lot of the work across the district that we're doing into a little bit more of a unified vision, which um, I've been lucky enough to be part of the design team, and I think it's been great. So I'll speak to specifically for the math portion, but then also kind of the overall goal. For math, an aspect that we've always been working towards, I'm sure that we have a coach at each of the elementary schools. And for a variety of reasons, it's been at different FTEs at different schools throughout our time. So the increase for that 0.5 literally is just a, an ask to get all schools up to 1.0. So for us, that's just kind of uh, filling out the, the remainder of the program. Um, at some point also, there's also an ask for a middle school coach. I think the last time I was at a school committee, we were talking about heterogeneous classes. And uh, there was a comment I, from one of the members about what kind of infrastructure and support would you actually have if you were to switch to a seventh grade um, heterogeneous class? So the coach there is, is essentially part of the infrastructure that we'd be planning for to move forward with that. So for me, the, the vision overall is um, I'm a big believer in tier one instruction. I'm a big believer in um, ensuring that what we're offering inside of a class values as many kids as possible. Um, what I've seen throughout the years is that my 10th year is an increase in the number of kids who are in the high school. They're essentially enrolling in our honors class, AP classes. We are seeing fewer and fewer students in the middle school who need tier two and tier three intervention. Um, these aren't perfect metrics. I'm just trying to think of things off the top of my head. But those two things speak pretty heavily to me where we're reducing those students who need pullout services and we're increasing the number of students who are in accessing honors classes. To me, that's been a direct result of that work that we've been doing over the past seven, eight years with coaching uh, for the math department. Um, and just to kind of solidify that part, we started seven years ago with the math coaches who were working purely with tier one, uh, and that program has grown. When we first started, it was three and a half. Uh, now we're, I think, 6.5 FTE, roughly around there, and we just wanted to finish off that. Uh, Ms. Perry, can you talk about the the role the coaches have had in developing our early literacy instruction this, just this past year? Certainly, I'd be happy to. Um, with the, um, with the phonics, phonics instruction that, we're, um, that we've been implementing in grades K to three, um, there's been a real um, necessary role for the coaches in helping teachers 
figure out how to, not so much how to implement the, the assessments, but how to use that information in their teaching. So there's um, a lot of modeling, um, a lot of um, PD, um, individual work, group work with those teachers, mostly to make the teachers comfortable with the processes that we need to use in order to have this new program um, alive and well and working. Um, it's been very successful and the teachers I think are increasingly comfortable. So that's been a huge success for us. Again, um, this all moves towards having strong tier one instruction, which is what Matt was talking about. Um, we have added, or we have a proposal to add a coach at the middle school level, grades six and seven. It's part of the school improvement plan for Gibbs. Um, and the purpose of, of that is the same thing. It's to sort of enhance tier one instruction in the classroom, particularly around issues of reading comprehension, um, which is um, something we're trying to do to, to alleviate the pressure on reading teachers who are um, occupied very, very um, sort of comprehensively with, um, with tier three instruction. So that's, that's a new ask that um, is good for you to know about. Um, I could talk more, but I think we should move on to the next person. Dr. Hoyo. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. Um, when I first came in um, to this position, one of the things I was hearing from uh, the science teachers at the Gibbs was that they could tell what school each student came from based on their science uh, knowledge. And so one of the things that that Miss Huber, our science coach, has really been focused on over the last three years is to create a standardized curriculum for uh, K through five. Um, and in addition to that, we're trying to move away from solely content knowledge and more focused on um, science skills or the science practices, uh, because it's not enough to know science. We really uh, want to do science, and, and we think that that is extremely important. However, um, most elementary teachers do not get trained in science. Their, their courses are very math and ELA focused, and so that's really the work that we're doing right now is teaching teachers how to teach science. How do you teach inquiry? How do you teach students to ask questions? Um, and really focusing on science practices and to have one coach you know, help 125 teachers, it's extremely difficult. So we're really looking um, to add support so that that work can be done. Thank you. And I, Mr. Conklin could not be here, so I can just give a quick summary, like uh, similar to science, social studies are curating their own curriculum. And in order to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all students and being inclusive of all cultures and backgrounds, it takes a lot of work to look at the current standards and understand how to supplement them. And again, you only, right now we have two social studies coaches and we need to add another one so that they can service the number of elementary schools uh, in our district and the number of teachers. And as you can see from the different explanation, we are really focused on strengthening tier one because that's going to give the most efficient and the most equitable way of approaching instruction instead of trying to intervention our way out of it. So thank you everyone for contributing and hopefully that was answering some of the questions um, from the school committee members. Thank you, Ms. Morgan and Dr. Allison Ampey for your questions. You have anything more, Jane? Uh, just, it it would be helpful. So I, I think that that was helpful. Um, I'm definitely intrigued with the um, the the ELA coach at the Gibbs because that seems new, and I starts starts me wondering if you know is where where do we go from there? Like I, I don't know, right? I don't know where the what the vision is, but it would be helpful, I guess, to to get that in writing. Um, Somehow, I, I appreciate the the vision from the from the the chairs. I just I don't have a sense of um, of of where this is of where this is going. So that that like where this is going in terms of how many you know how many people we're talking about down the road. So that that will be helpful for me in understanding how much of that this particular list of asks 
addresses um, and how much is still sort of left on the table. So um, thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, so first I'll follow up on the on the coach, coaching. Um, and when we did the five-year plan, we did have that vision for one literacy coach and one math coach at each of the elementary schools. And so, yes, we're on the way to achieving that. Um, and maybe there are some tweaks that are needed. We had a coordinator, a half-time coordinator position in the five-year plan, and now maybe we need it as a full-time, who knows? Those, so those kind of tweaks are expected, but I think some of what we're seeing, sorry, hold on just a minute. So some of what we're seeing in the request is sort of this, this new idea that we need um, coaches at the middle school level, maybe instead of just one elementary school coach in science and social studies, we need more. Um, we need one in ESL, we need one in SEL. So again, it, just some sort of vision of, of when, we, when we built the five-year plan, you know, Dr. Alice Hampi was very clear. We wanted a vision of what our elementary schools would look like at the end of that five-year plan. So I think what we want, I mean, we're not gonna be able to do this coaching model in one year, but if, if there is this new idea of this new time expanded coaching model, what is it going to look like when we get there at the end of a multi-year implementation plan? And what is that going to get us? Uh, as, as somebody else had, had mentioned, what, is, what are we gonna use, use to measure success? Um, so just a question, I mean, we, we will have opportunity for my fellow members on, on um, under the budget schedule of the budget calendar, our next meeting, January 13th, is when we give our input of you know, what we see as the priorities. Um, not that we can't give input now, but that's, that's also on the agenda. Um, just a question, the items 32 and 41, the learning specialists at the elementary school. So the, with that at Hardy and Thompson, that would bring us to, to four at each of those schools. Is, 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 we're just adding another learning specialist now, is that what we're, we're doing? Is, I see Ms. Perrette's nodding her head yes. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to have the principals or and or um, Ms. Elmer speak to that as well. But Ms. Perrett, do you want to start? Sure. Um, and this request comes from, um, sorry, I have a little cold, so I'm a little hoarse this evening. Forgive me. Um, comes from really wanting to support our students as best we can with the most highly qualified people possible. I don't think it's a secret that we've been having staffing issues and um, a lot of those positions that have been left um, unfilled this year have been in the paraprofessional department. Um, and so what is happening is that and you know, some of this has to do with the pandemic, obviously, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, build our staff back up in the future. But that what we're seeing is without those supports in place, um, we're doing the best that we can, but there are services that are being left um, undone, kids who are being left, and you hear this in the news across the country, so Hardy's not unique in this, but in our opinion, you know, being able to put forward and hire for the most highly qualified people, those are the jobs we're able to fill. Um, we don't have those problems within our professional teaching staff. Um, and I think that what we're seeing as we look at our data with our students is that we really do need those people who are highly trained to be with those children who, you know, have the right to those services on their IEPs. Um, we also support an increase um, of 0.24 EL services so that we can have two full-time EL teachers at Hardy to help support those students as well. So I think it's trying to find more of a balance. It's also about making sure that um, we're really looking at the distribution, the workload of the learning specialists specifically at this time and thinking about how we can create uh, a plan that is more equitable. Um, so th those are some of the basic talking points. Great, thank you. So I mean, again, as a request of what you know, additional information would be helpful, would be the caseloads of each at each school, right? So how many kids um, require learning specialist support at each school, um, uh, and you know, are the needs 
what it, I know we have a separate working group on on special education workloads, um, but I don't I don't know what the typical workload is. I mean, when my kids started in elementary school, I think uh, uh, Miss, Mrs. Z probably is the only one here that remembers that there was one learning specialist at each elementary school. And now we're talking, and obviously they're bigger now, but we're now we're talking to go to going to four. Um, so, and I don't know that we've closed the achievement gap with our IEP students. So, um, you know, I, I would like to see more information on what the caseloads are and, and, and more justification for doing this at those two select schools. I think I would add to that just a little, oh, sorry, Dr. Homan. Oh, it's okay, go ahead. I just would add to that too, that I agree with you. And I think that we also need to really look at, you know, what services that we're offering um, and the kinds of needs that our students have. I think we're seeing that that's, that's changing um, and the needs are becoming greater. And so that, uh, you know, we can have IEPs that have different levels of service. So we have to take that next step to really kind of tease out you know, it, there's a number of IEPs, there's a number of students that are serviced by our, um, our, our educational professionals, but that it's also um, the kind of service that's being given and the uh, number of staff members who are part of that. I think we have to look at the bigger structure also. Um, special education brings a lot of paperwork with it. Um, and so that maybe there are also other ways that we can look at who the point people are for um, different children within their IEPs and really think about the roles of those learning specialists at the same time. Right, yeah, so that kind of vision about what the team chair does, what the learning specialists do, um, what the paraprofessionals do at other districts, they have um, inclusion support professionals that are a different position um, and that are paid higher, um, so I think you know, we'd sort of like, again, we'd like to see what the vision is going to be for the long term for, for inclusion support um, in order to sort of justify whatever it is we want to do in the budget. Um, can I respond to this quickly? Um, I think this is, I, I appreciate the feedback to sort of lay out a vision for what uh, an elementary school's service levels may need to be and analysis of what the service delivery grid demands as well as caseloads are for each school will certainly be part of the analysis that we do when we develop a budget to bring forward to the school committee. Um, but I appreciate this uh, desire to sort of see a vision for what the staffing levels at a uh, school might need to look like and what we might hope for it to be over the next five years. So that's something we can think about developing into the budget. I didn't know if Ms. Elmer had more to say about this particular topic. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> so I think um, what you were seeing is that these were requests that came from the individual budget meetings we had with buildings um, as, as well with curriculum directors. So I think each of the buildings made their rationale for that, um, as opposed to what you're requesting um, Mr. Cardin, a larger picture of that structure. So as Dr. Homan is talking um, about, you know, we have to fit that into the larger discussion around what our structures, what our staffing, what are ways that we can also reorganize um, how we do things, you know, and are there efficiencies and are there ways to group students and to schedule um, interventions and to do classroom assignments that can also make sure that we aren't overtaxing our special educators. So I think there's a lot of work of it to do with that. And as Dr. Holman said, these are initial requests coming from the building that we're going to explore. And then as we do more of that analysis, make final recommendations to you later. Great, that's all I have. Thank you. Sexton. Thank you. Um, first, I just wanted to say thank you for the way that this was laid out. <clears throat> it was really helpful to see what was coming um, from the five-year plan and what were new asks and how they met different um, district goals. So I appreciate um, the way that this was set up. Um, a lot of my questions have been asked, but I guess to follow up on Mr. Cardin, can you, because I'm going to explain the difference between 32 and 41 special education learning specialist and 39 a learning specialist at Pierce, or is that the same thing? I believe that is the same thing with a slightly different title. Mr. Mason and Mr. Amadi, do you agree? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So is that... So actually, Mr. Cardin mentioned this too. So like, 
an inclusion specialist is the idea that that they are pushing into the general education classroom to support students as a in that space is that so um miss x and i do believe that um what you're seeing is um a combination of different um, things that we've talked about. Um, so any of those requests that are in there right now would be learning specialists that came from the buildings. If they're tied to a specific building, that means the building principal made that request. Um, as Mr. Cardin had mentioned, inclusion specialists are something that we are considering um, as we think to the future. Inclusion specialists do serve a different role um, when you look at other districts. Um, inclusion specialists often will support the team in planning and executing and guiding and, and thinking about strategies and supports um, and may not have a direct service caseload in the sense that, you know, they're polling students, they, they would be more of, as um, Mr. Cardin had mentioned, a, a different role within the special ed department. Um, I think if you look at some of our neighboring districts, Belmont has a role, um, Newton Public Schools has that role. So that is definitely something we are looking into, um, but that is just a, a typo on that current document you have. So this individual would typo. be service delivery, not an inclusion specialist. Okay, so this piece that says, allow the peers to shift to an inclusion model that allows a special education teacher to work in one or two specific classes daily, that's not, that's more about service delivery. So right. I'm making sure that specialist, right. it would create, they currently have two learning specialists at the Pierce School. And so um, if it's our smallest school, um, however, it is growing in size, but it's referring to um, having that ability to, you know, group or team with four and five grades two and three, grades K and one, rather than the two individuals, but it would be a traditional learning specialist role that um, Mr. Ramadi was requesting. Okay. Thank you. And then I had question, the same question as Ms. Morgan about reserve teachers. Um, so I think I'm all set. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, a lot of my questions have been answered, but I do sort of puzzle around line 76, 77, and 78, painting at all schools, flooring at all schools, and ceiling tile replacement. Um, this is an add-on list. So my question is, how are we funding painting, flooring, and ceiling tiles currently? And why wouldn't this be looked at as sort of a, in addition to a line item in a regular budget rather than what seems to be adding uh, a new place. Is this something drastically new or what's going on here? This is a good question. This is a request that came to us from uh, Mr. Walters on one of his final days with the district. I will defer it to Mr. Mason because he had many conversations about facilities maintenance with Mr. Walters. Uh, Mr. Mason. Yes, thank you, Dr. Holman. Um, thank you, Mr. Slickman for asking this question. Um, so this as this this particular request is has not been necessarily been funded at the level that is reflected in this document. So um, in the past, we've done painting projects prior to last year. Um, and there was a year before that. We would have uh, summer workers or students go around and paint the buildings, and there was a a minor budget set aside. Um, around about $20,000 to paint all schools. And um, that program slightly shifted with when we, when we brought in the new facilities director, uh, we went to hire more contracted workers to provide the services. And with last year's, uh, 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 we had a little bit of funding at the end of the year, we were able to shift some of the funding to do that, but there was never any, not a dedicated line for it. So this year, what Greg Walters, Mr. Walters and I uh, discussed was how to set up a plan where we are painting, uh, uh, having a schedule of painting or replacing flooring throughout the district. Um, and at the same time, we were gonna propose to put it to capital as well. Um, just wanna provide an update to this that we were um, 
going through our natural capital planning. This was the reasoning I was late to today's meeting was there was discussion about these exact requests and capital, uh, capital planning feeling that as though this is regular maintenance when this is, these are substantial projects. Um, and so this, these requests are indeed should remain here and uh, we would just need to try to incorporate and find a way to fund these projects in fiscal 23 and onward. Another thought uh, that I'd like to share is that these funds do not, will not uh, cover uh, a substantial portion of the school district, especially, you know, as we program the new high school and that square footage comes on as well. So um, even though that when a new high school starts off, you may not need it, but in the out years, we'll need to program additional funding as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. So those are the thoughts behind why we were putting this request in there. It was to try to put a normal schedule to what needs to be maintained in the buildings that were not necessarily scheduled or funded in the, the current budget. You, you can sort of understand why I get a little nervous when I see this popping up here in that if this is something that was funded, say, out of capital budget and they're telling us, no, 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 we're not going to do it out of capital, you need to do it out of operating. Now, all of a sudden, we have a shift of expenditures into our operating budget and we're governed by a, a funding formula uh, on what we can raise for operations. So if funding, if costs are being shifted into our operating budget, we're going to need to be able to identify that um, going forward with FinCom so that uh, we don't end up losing uh, $310,000 worth of services to students because something was moved into our operating budget. The, uh, the only other thing is, this is a very, very good list and I'm glad to ha it, have it done early, but it would help for analysis, not to have this as a PDF, but to have this as an Excel file. And uh, so I'd just like to ask that uh, members uh, get this as an Excel file as well, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holman. Thank you uh, to the hall, all the staff. And I will leave it to you whether you can let these people go or make them stay all night. I would love to let them go. They've had a very long day. Thank you all so much for being here and taking the time. We appreciate you. Thank you all. Happy holidays. Uh, the next item on the uh, agenda is Fair School Improvement Plan, Dr. Holman. All right, I'm very happy to introduce the principal and assistant principal of the Pierce School, Mr. Amadi and Ms. Goodrich are Ms. Goodrich are here, and they're going to present the Pierce School Improvement Plan. I know they had a wonderful Rainbow Commission event at their school this week, and that there are many happy faces in the pictures that I saw from that event, and I'm sure they'll share that and many more wonderful things about Pierce with you tonight. So, Mr. Amadi, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Goodrich, are you able to project the slide deck? Thank you very much. I want to start um, by just saying hello. Um, I, I'm Andrew Amati. This is my second year uh, leading uh, this wonderful school, Pierce Elementary. I want to thank you, <clears throat> thank Dr. Homan for the opportunity to present uh, this evening. And I want to say thank you to members of the school committee um, for what you do to support our town and also specifically for approving the role of assistant principal last year. Um, and with that, I want to introduce uh, Miss Olivia Goodrich uh, and, and give her a chance to say hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Olivia Goodrich. I'm happy to be here. And I just wanted to say that I've really enjoyed getting to know the Pierce community and the greater Arlington community um, over the past couple of months. We can go to the next slide, please. So this is our agenda for the evening. Um, we'll do a brief introduction, talk about a few wins, a few areas to focus on, some of our specific um, priorities and action steps, um, a brief discussion about potential resources, and at the end, I'm open to answer uh, any, any questions you may have um, for, for me. So um, I feel very fortunate um, 
to be to be the school leader here uh, at, at the Pierce building. We are a tight knit community um, of really strong educators. Um, we, we currently have 17 sections and the addition of a new um, SLC, the SLCD. We're benefited by a very strong teaching core, a hardworking uh, PTO, supportive school council, our school dig, and our, our Rainbow Alliance team, who is um, well represented by families, faculty. And as uh, Dr. Homan alluded to, uh, we had a, a wonderful event on Tuesday where we had uh, about a dozen faculty members, uh, 50, 50 or 60 students and their family members um, do read alouds uh, together um, centered around inclusivity um, and, and, um, and, and mutual respect. And that was a really wonderful event for us. We're a growing community. Um, and right now we serve approximately 330 students. Um, and over the course of the last five years, we have grown by a section um, each year, year over year, with the expectation that we'll grow um, by, by one more section next year um, into our fifth grade, which would, which would then have uh, 18 um, sections along with our, our supported learning center. Next slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, we, we have a very strong uh, PTO here at Pierce that works very hard to support our families, um, our students and our teachers. And uh, that really one of, one of the kind of hallmarks of what our PTO has done is to support our school library, um, which is something we're very proud of um, and is kind of a cornerstone of, of our school. Um, so kind of move into the, the wins block here. One of the things I want to start with uh, by sharing is the work that we've done during our, our ACE blocks this year. Um, we have really focused our ACE blocks around uh, four week coaching cycles that we've used specifically to plan and reflect on uh, tier one instruction. And we prioritized peer observations uh, across our school. So what that looks like uh, so far this, this fall has been um, teachers from specific grade levels going and watching their colleagues uh, teach mathematics um, ac across the school. And, th and this is something that's new for the Pierce building um, and was, was kind of kicked off by our, our, um, our, our wonderful math coach, uh, Steph McKenna. Um, and it's something we wanna build on. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an initial win uh, for our school and it's something we wanna build on in the second half of the year and moving forward. And I'll share just a couple other brief wins that we'll see in the, in the data as well. Um, it, last year, in terms of our school achievement, we, we noted some very strong um, achievement data in, in our fifth grade, specifically in, in science, um, but also in, in other content areas as well. We've noted a, a, a strength in um, language acquisition um, that is above average for English language learners and former English language learners in both math and literacy. Another noted win is a, is a we have a culture uh, that I believe is cohesive and collaborative um, with, with staff, with families, with our local partnerships. This is a place where uh, people know one another, they care about one another, um, and that's evident in many, many ways. And the last one I've noted is that we have some um, strengths in our professional learning here. Um, and as I alluded to, the, um, the, the utilization of ACE has been really integral to our, our um, professional learning so far this year. And we also have had um, quite a bit of faculty support and input around our, our faculty meetings and our professional learning opportunities so far this year. We have three noted areas uh, to focus on this year, which um, the first being around, sorry, something in my eye here, around mathematics instruction. Um, last year on our, on our MCAS uh, in grades three through five, um, about 40% of our students were not proficient um, in mathematics across grades three, four, and five. Um, and, and that's really not uh, acceptable. Um, and, and I don't mean to say like acceptable from, from what folks are doing, but we know that we want our students, more students that are on grade level or above grade level. And we have some um, specific areas that we wanna focus in with math. One, to focus on grade level standards, cohesion across um, grade levels, 
along with working on specific teaching moves. And, and one of the things we're focusing on um, this year as a school is academic discourse, um, which can be called different things, but essentially that students discuss mathematics daily in class with one another um, as kind of a, a priority for our school. Um, a second area that we're focusing on is um, family engagement. And really what this, what this um, goal is about is doing more outreach, more specific outreach, uh, outreach in, in multiple languages and multiple modes to allow all families to be fully participatory, um, respecting cultures and respecting languages and giving everyone associated with the peers uh, an opportunity to engage. The last area of focus um, is really around uh, an emphasis on early literacy, uh, prioritizing um, early universal uh, screening assessments, deploying more resources into our earliest grades and making sure that as our students move through grades K, one and two, um, that they're fully prepared uh, to access all content areas in the upper elementary grades. All right, so, um, and I'll be brief in these upcoming graphs. Um, this is really an overview of mathematics on the left-hand side. Um, what we're seeing here is kind of a flat uh, math achievement over the course of the 2018, 2019, uh, and 2021 school year. And on the right-hand side, uh, this is a measure of how we kind of do compared to the district uh, or how we did last year compared to the district. And um, they're relatively similar uh, when, you, when you compare Pierce um, to the district at large in grades three through five. On this slide, um, we have language arts on the, on the left side, science on the right. And what, what we see is again in, in language arts, um, our, our performance uh, mirrors uh, relatively closely what we see at the district level with approximately 25% uh, of our students um, uh, not meeting or exceeding grade level benchmarks. And on the right-hand side is one of the areas I noted as a, as a real area of win. So this is our science data, um, approximately 80% um, you know, of our students have meet, meet, met proficiency or above. Uh, and this is a real area of win for us. And one of the things I wanted to note on this slide that you won't see in the data is that when we talk to students about what do you really love about school? What, do you, what are your favorite things to learn about? It's often that we hear that, that science is one of those, um, is one of those topics. Students are very excited about science. And so I noted this tonight just as a, um, an area that we're very proud of and that we know students are excited about uh, here at the Pierce School. So we, we've touched on some of these um, kind of early signals. Uh, we, we see areas of, um, of strength with um, our language learners and former language learners. Um, we, um, when we look at our students that are categorized as high needs, which encompasses many categories, um, it, it tells us different things. So, so we know that we've made improvements um, and that students with disabilities have more access across uh, tier one instruction. Uh, and we also know that, that we need to do more to support our students uh, in the classroom um, to be successful in all content areas. And then um, with respect to um, our, our, our BIPOC students, uh, what, what we are seeing right now are lower rates um, of proficiency, um, particularly in mathematics. Uh, and, and this is an area why we, why we are, are one of the reasons why we feel like academic discourse across mathematics daily is such a vital thing for our school because um, if we can do that well, all students will have the opportunity to speak um, daily and share daily and be able to analyze and critique one another's math instruction. And it is our um, kind of theory of action that doing that will, will raise um, all students, um, all students up in the area of mathematics. And uh, what we have here is a, is a overview of our panorama survey data. So, um, the left side being the percent favorable, the middle column being a comparison of uh, peers to other elementary schools. 
And on the right hand side, a, a comparison over time. So when you see the up arrow, uh, the up green arrow, that's in reference to how um, families said that we did um, from the fall to the spring. So, you know, we had some upward trends in, in every um, area here, which we're, we're proud of, um, notably in cultural awareness and action. Um, this is an area that our families noticed that, um, you, you know, that we do, we do well here at Pierce, that we um, are culturally aware, that we put actions into place to, um, to, to value all of our students and families. And it was also noted that in, uh, in learning behaviors, that our families recognized that there were things that uh, we, we could do to improve. And these, this was a measure of things like, how much do kids talk about learning at home? How often do they read for fun? How organized are they uh, in, in their own work? Um, and so this is, this is noted as kind of an, an area that we're, we're working in within our uh, professional learning here at Pierce. Now, I won't go to, into all of these, but essentially these are our action steps here and, and things that we will be um, centering our professional work around uh, this year. Um, and I would say kind of the, the, the kind of through line here in terms of what we'll be working on at the Pierce building is really focusing on peer observations and having faculty members have multiple opportunities to see their peers in action, to offer compliments, to learn uh, best practices, and to, to share any questions they have with one another. Um, this has been a really um, popular and meaningful uh, move so far for our building and, and will be something that we'll, uh, we're planning on um, using across content areas uh, as we move forward uh, through the school year. And with that, um, I'll stop talking and open it up for any questions you may have for me. Any members of the committee have any questions or comments you'd like to share? Mr. Schlickman still has his hand up, but I think that's from the last time. Is it Mr. Schlickman or do you have a question or comment? It is from last time, but I, I want to thank uh, uh, the Pierce community for, uh, for a very good report. Thank you. Just a Thielman. You mentioned it, this is not necessarily the, the, first of all, I agree with uh, Mr. Schlickman, it's an excellent report and uh, very uh, uplifting. And I, I congratulate you on all the on all the innovations you've brought to the school. My question is about um, space and crowding in the building. Can you just speak to that a little bit? Sure, Mr. Thielman. Uh, is there something specific you'd like me to address in that question or, or just in general terms? General. Yeah, so right now we have all of our space essentially utilized, um, all of our classrooms. Um, we have we have consolidated um, adult working spaces to have shared offices. Um, we currently have the, the daycare uh, on the first floor. We have um, added the SLC um, D and, and if we need to move um, by one more section, then, then that will be something that, you know, we'll need to discuss um, you know, with, with the leadership team to find that, to find that space, um, because currently it doesn't, it doesn't really exist. Okay, that's where I was going. So if we, if we add one more class, or if one more classroom, one more section is added in the school, there's, you would lose another, an art room or whatever. <clears throat> yes, and, and I, I do not want to lose an art room. Okay. Okay. Dr. I don't want to, don't want to take us off topic. Thank you very much. Mr. Thielman, I just want to note that we're not in a position to lose an R room at Pierce. We're working on this and it's on our radar and we will have a plan to make sure that they have the classrooms that they need and the specialist rooms they need. Thank you, Dr. Holman. It's music to my ears. Anyone else? Mr. Carden. Uh, just a quick question while you're here that's a little unrelated to the plan. Um, but I see that the HCA, the Housing Corporation of America building that's in your district is is starting to open. Have you heard from them about families moving in with enrollments or, or anything yet? I have not. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Amadi and Ms. Goodrich. Uh, please pass on to your staff. We appreciate all the work that you're all doing. Thank you very much. Dr. Holman, do you have anything you'd like to add? 
just a thank you to the Pierce team and very nice job. Thank you. Mr. Do, we need, do, we need, do we need a motion to accept this? That's usually Mr. Schlickman's role. Okay, uh, Mr. Thielman uh, made a motion. Is there a second to accept this uh, school improvement plan? Second the motion to receive. Motion to receive, right. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. And I vote yes, unanimous. Thank you again. We're all set to move on to the uh, bracket school improvement plan, Dr. Holman. All right. Uh, I want to welcome Ms. Zerjikov and where does she go? And Ms. Schwartz, who are the principal and assistant principal at the Brackett School for a very comprehensive school improvement plan report. Um, one of my favorite things to do is visit Brackett in the morning and stand with Ms. Zerjikov out front, which I've only had the pleasure of doing once, but um, I intend to do again because it's just absolutely wonderful to watch her welcome all of the kids into the school. Brackett's such a happy place to visit. So I'm looking forward to hearing their report too. It's all yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for the kind words, Dr. Holman. And um, it is the highlight of your day to stand in front of school and watch all the boys and girls coming across the field and climbing out of cars. And the, you learn a lot and you, it's wonderful to greet everyone. Um, my name is, is Stephanie Zerjikov and I have the best job in the world. I'm principal at Brackett School. And I am happy to be joined tonight by Nicole Schwartz. Uh, Nicole has been a teacher at Brackett since 2005. And she's taught both first grade and fourth grade. And this year, she seamlessly stepped into the role as our assistant principal. Um, she has been doing involved in the leadership team of the school for many years and has taken on a lot of responsibilities and we are a better place for her work. We trust you've had the opportunity to look through our school improvement plan. Uh, this year, every plan is a partnership between the district administration team, district goals for the coming year in collaboration with the bracket teaching teams, building leadership team and the school council. Each year we reflect on the prior year and the data we have in front of us to come prize initiatives and action steps for moving forward. I do wanna take a moment to thank all of the members of the school committee um, for your support over the years. Our community is a very important part of our school that we highly value. We as school value of our school community and we're hopeful that you see the threads of that in our school improvement plan because it is the driving force of our work we want to point out here to everyone how important the ACE block that we have built into our calendar is to the work that's happening across all disciplines. We utilize our weekly grade level blocks for professionals in the building to come together. During this time, there's a collaboration between the teams of teachers, service providers, and coaches around student performance and instructional practice. This time continues to be a valuable resource for all of our work. We continue to be dedicated to improving literacy instruction for all of our students. There has been a lot of attention in the world around literacy and quality instruction. And it is our belief that literacy is highly intertwined with not only students ability to read, but their ability to access curriculum across the disciplines. Mathematics has also become a priority area for us to pay more attention to for our students, which Nicole will speak about in a few moments. So tonight we'll give you an overview of Bracket and share some wins and challenges, our priorities for the coming school years and some key initiatives and action steps that are <coughs> already underway. Nicole? All right. 
Um, so hi, uh, before I move into like any of the data that we're going to talk about and uh, the data digging that we've done and the priorities that we've targeted for the year, um, I really just want to take a minute and point out how proud we are of our staff and our students and our families and the district team um, for like all of the hard work that everyone's put to get, you know, put forth um, before the pandemic, but especially now during this pandemic. Um, we know everyone's working really, really hard, um, and we just think that everyone sort of in our building and across the district really deserves some praise um, for all of that um, hard work that they're doing. Uh, the priorities I'm about to share uh, with all of you are really just a small snapshot of the really amazing things that happen on a daily basis in our building. Um, they're part of a collaboration, as Stephanie said, like between our leadership team, uh, classroom teachers, our service providers, um, the district coaches, and the district admin team. Um, so they say it takes a village, and it really does. Um, when looking at all of our building-based data, uh, which I personally have a really strong passion for analyzing and reflecting upon, um, we really try to take um, an equity lens. So rather than look at just how all students are doing, really looking at how some of our subgroups um, are doing as well. Um, so our building priorities have really been drafted with, uh, with all of that in mind. So our first building priority um, is really focused around literacy. So when looking at our response to intervention plan, um, students with reading goals on IEP grids, um, and really the overall model for in literacy instruction, we realized that we were pretty limited with how many students could receive reading support, uh, particularly in grades K through three from a reading specialist. So that's some of the data that you see here on the screen. Um, we know really well that comprehension skills in the upper elementary school uh, and middle school are directly correlated to uh, early literacy skills, particularly phonics and phonemic awareness. So uh, as a result of that, we really began to reflect on the model and reimagine how we could target the reading needs of the largest number of students in our building. So when we looked back at um, data from 2018, we found that we were servicing about 55 students. That number pre stayed pretty stagnant for the next two years. Um, but with prioritizing the hiring of a third reading specialist in our building, we are in a really great place today where I can proudly say we've been able to provide small group instruction uh, in literacy to every student in our building and 110 students are receiving uh, reading support from a reading specialist right now. Um, so we're really excited about that. Uh, our second uh, school-based priority is around mathematics, which um, you've heard from some of the other buildings is also a priority. Uh, when we looked back at our data um, back to 2015, we had noticed um, some decline in student achievement across our subgroups and as a whole. So with some support from our building-based math coach and a partnership with our building, uh, our district SEL coach, our goal this year as it pertains to math is really about paying close attention to how our students uh, are performing and participating in their math communities and really trying to prioritize uh, SEL work that happens and really needs to continue to happen across the disciplines, particularly in math. Uh, we feel pretty strongly that we can make some changes by focusing our attention on how students are participating uh, on a daily basis in their math classes. We have a new math interventionist this year um, who is supporting students in classrooms with their math learning. And we also have prioritized some enrichment and uh, enrichment activities to enhance and promote some, uh, some academic growth for our proficient students. So, um, so that's where we're looking sort of in terms of math priorities. Um, our third priority this year, um, which you'll see on the next two slides, um, is really a story that we need to address related to our high needs students. So our high needs population um, is really just a category created by the state that includes uh, students who are receiving special education services, those students who are identified as low socioeconomic, uh, in the low socioeconomic subgroup, um, and or those who are non-native speakers and are identified as English language learners. So really it's kind of a catch all for some of those smaller uh, subgroups. Uh, but what this group really shares is the risk category. So uh, some of these graphs here just show uh, based on our accountability data in grades three through five, that while only um, the range of students in grades three, four and five uh, who are categorized in that high needs group are, it ranges from 12 to 24. So while it doesn't seem so high, we'd really like to see some changes in some of their achievement. Uh, we feel pretty strongly that our students uh, can and should learn uh, without such a wide discrepancy in achievement. So our equity goal this year um, is really related to how our high needs students are performing. And as a result, providing our staff with opportunities for professional development to learn some techniques for differentiating instruction um, in all of our subject areas in an effort to sort of remove some uh, barriers for learning uh, and decrease this achievement gap. 
So with all of that said, um, I'm gonna try and quickly summarize some of, uh, a good chunk of what was just shared. Uh, and here are our three um, objectives that we drafted this year um, after some of the data digging. Um, one, focusing on whole group and small group reading instruction and con some continued progress monitoring. Um, two, working on employing strategies during math instruction uh, to ensure some equitable access to the curriculum. And then three, prioritizing differentiation um, to meet the me needs of all of our students. With that, um, what you have here are just a few of our key action steps uh, to show kind of what this looks like on the ground um, and in the building. And I think what you'll find threaded in what I'm about to share um, is really a deep commitment, not only to building teacher uh, capacity and confidence, providing the time and professional development that's needed to do that, but also our commitment to um, our students and looking at the whole child. So already we've done some good PD with our teachers on uh, new assessment tools in literacy um, and looking at uh, some district-wide phonemic awareness uh, curriculum and utilizing our, our literacy coaches to do some modeling um, in classrooms and work with that PD. Uh, we've worked really hard to operation, operationalize um, the results of those assessments and to, those assessment tools and have recently completed our first data cycle um, of small group instruction are, and are now in the process of progress monitoring and we're seeing some good success with our students. Um, in math, we've partnered with our uh, building-based math coach and the, the district-wide uh, SEL coach around SEL practices in math classrooms. And we've begun to create um, some teacher toolboxes to support students with uh, intervention um, activities as well as enrichment needs. And teachers have started to focus on some student participation and discourse. And we've tried to build a lot of this work into our weekly ACE calendar, which I think you've heard from most of the principals um, in, S, uh, in, the S, uh, in their school permit plans has really been a great tool to utilize um, to get some of this work done. And then as it relates to our equity goal, we're in the process right now of solidifying some workshops um, in the spring with CAST, which is um, based out of Wakefield around universal design for learning, which is really just a way for um, thinking about teaching and learning that helps give students an equal opportunity um, like to succeed. So it, it's an approach that just offers some flexible ways for students to access material, engage with it, um, and to show what they know. Um, Coming up in January, we're holding some uh, staff professional development led by district-wide faculty members, including our um, building BCBA, the SEL coach, um, and, and our school psychologists around some specific areas of interest and need in our building related to differentiating needs um, for students. Um, and we've worked really hard this year to tighten our response to student needs by implementing a pretty robust student response team um, and process where teachers are working together to offer um, strategies to one another and interventions that can be used um, in classrooms to support students learning. So currently we have resources in place that are supporting our work. We have a full-time district and building specialist to support the ACE blocks, an early release schedule and calendar that allows us the time to work on our goals, a building-based math coach and interventionists and three reading specialists. To continue making progress towards our goals, we believe that we need to maintain our third reading specialist, add another special educator and a part-time social worker to our team. And we need to continue to provide meaningful professional development for all of our staff around our areas of focus. So this wraps up our presentation. Thank you for your time. And we are open to questions and comments. Thank you very much uh, for, for a great presentation. Very colorful and very informative. Uh, from the members, do any of the members have any questions or comments that they'd like to make? Uh, Mr. Schleckman. Uh, for, uh, first, I wanted to say I was really touched by the description of uh, uh, greeting children coming into the school. Uh, when I was a principal, I would greet them with the phrase "Happy School Day," um, and and it, it was really important to to have that greeting in the morning. But as to the school improvement plan that I'm looking at, if this thing was a hamburger, 
I would be very, very unhappy because this is so very well done. Uh, it's a very thoughtful analysis and I move receipt. I second receipt. I, I, I got to think about the analogy, Paul. But yeah, we'll hold off on that for a bit. Before we vote on this, let's get a few more comments. Dr. Ampy. Thank you. And thank you for this, um, for your presentation and your SIP. And, and also, Mr. Amani, I, I thank you for yours too. Um, they're both excellent. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the learning about and implementing SEL in classroom mathematics communities. So yeah, so we've been working with the SEL coach in the district around ways with which we can implement some more SEL practices across the disciplines as we're finding that particularly after the pandemic that students are um, showing some more social emotional needs than we have seen in the past, but really as best practices to be supporting students feeling of well being of um, belonging to their communities and across those district uh, across those disciplines. Um, and it's actually been some work that's happening outside of just bracket so it's work that's happening in the district around really incorporating SEL across the day and not just in sort of small separate segments of the day um, and coupled with that we have we do have some SEL curriculum that's being implemented in buildings, um, which is you know, really just to sort of offset some of that and teach some of the skills, but really looking at how we can embed SEL across the day instead of just having small segments of, um, of instruction, so. Okay, that, that's helpful. I, was, I wasn't sure if it was perhaps targeted towards trying not to have kids be math phobic or, or something like that. But what you're saying makes much more sense. I just didn't, I wasn't sure where it was going. So thank you. Anyone else this time? Seeing none, there was a motion I think made to accept uh, the SIP. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion. Is there any further discussion? Roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Dr. Ampey. Yes. Mr. Carden. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Can I call on you, Mr. Thielman? Sorry. Yes, you did. Yes, you, did. you can vote twice if you want. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yes, again. Okay. Don't confuse me. I'm old and confused. And I vote yes. Thank you very much. Uh, to your staff, to the principal, to the assistant principal, a phenomenal job. Thank you so much. Dr. Coleman, do you have, have anything else you'd like to add? I would just like to thank the Brackett and Pierce leadership for uh, their work on these plans and let them go so that they can be ready for tomorrow. <laughs> have a wonderful holiday, folks. Okay. Hey, moving on to the agenda, uh, monthly financial report, Mr. Mason. Thank you. Good evening, school committee. Um, thank you for understanding last uh, the last meeting to allow uh, allow me to uh, postpone it to this meeting to present you the documents uh, that was shared previously. Um, those included the monthly reports, um, which was for month ending period, uh, the month ending November 30th, that's period five. Um, that included the monthly reports for the general fund, the revolving, the grants, which also included the COVID-19 grants and the electronic, the electronic bus grant uh, sec sections, um, as well as uh, the end of year report um, summary page directly from the end of year report and uh, a memo that dis disclosed the changes from the previous years, uh, as well as uh, some uh, small analysis of special education spending. Um, I will start off with the, the financial reports for this period. Um, as you can see uh, in that period uh, for ending November 30th, the year to date expended um, was around $21.7 million, which we've spent about 27% of the budget, uh, where $54.6 million was, is, uh, was encumbered at the time, which is about 68.2%, which means 90, 5.3% of the budget has been uh, either spent or obligated to be spent. 
that left the, that leaves about 4.7 percent left to be spent which of that 2.5 million dollars or 2.6 million or so is projected to be spent leaving um, right now a projected balance of 1.1 million uh, still early uh, we you know we still haven't even started the really upon the winter season um, so uh, we'll keep the school committee apprised of any changes. And most of this uh, balance is once again, uh, tied to uh, the vacant positions uh, that we've been carrying and uh, special education and uh, out of district tuition and transportation related to that uh, in the budget. And uh, what you'll see in the report as well as a transfer that's yet to happen, which will be reflected in the December report as we just posted that transfer for this month. The revolving funds, um, there's you know, nothing new to, to note, except that the, you'll see that in the December reports, we'll see that transfer from the general fund to the circuit breaker for, for late related special education out of district tuition expenses. And um, we spent about 9.8% of the revolving budgets uh, of that, and we've collected about 29.8% of uh, what we were pre um, expecting to collect as of uh, period five. Um, our grants are in line. Um, we've spent about 11.6% of the grants budgets at this point, and uh, we've collected about the same amount in terms of revenue. Um, the COVID-19 related grants, uh, we've been awarded uh, about $2 million. They just recently we sent up the, the largest one, which is the ESSER three which was included in the memo and the, the, in the emotions that is recommended for the school committee to accept. Um, and uh, as well, there's nothing changed in terms of the bus grant portion, except that we've awarded uh, a vendor to manufacture the two buses, and that will take about nine to 12 months to complete. Um, I just wanna note that the three motions are the, the three grants that should be accepted. Uh, by the school committee uh, that we rec I recommend that you accept this evening is the Safe and Supportive Schools Competitive Grant, which was for $10,000, a smaller grant, which is the Secretary Advisory Group on Environmental Education, which was for $350 for instructional materials, and the ESSER three grant, which we've previously uh, uh, presented on, which is $1,133,000 and 650. $1,133,653. That's it, I'll stop there. If anybody has any questions on the end, on the monthly reports and then I can go into the end of year reports. Should we take that motion at this time? Dr. Ampey. So moved, I, I move all three motions if I can together. There's a second. Second, I second. <clears throat> Thank you. Any further discussion on that? Let's do a roll call vote. Ms. Sexton? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Carden? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Dr. Rampey? Yes. And I vote yes. Motion is carried. Mr. Mason, do you have some, something more? Yes, I just, just I mean, if there's any questions, I can go if you would like me to, to briefly talk about the end of year report. I mean, I think the memo explains what uh, our total spending was. We, we spent about $138 million in, in fiscal 21 on education in Arlington. Um, that is an increase of 23% from the previous year. And most of that is uh, tied, about $16 million is tied to the high school project. If you guys would like me to go any further, I could, or if there's specific questions, I... I would answer. Dr. Ampey. Thanks. Um, I actually had a question on the monthly report. I was just wondering about line 85804 computer software. I was wondering why that's running so high. Um, that, that is due to um, the, the increased uh, of the use of software due to what we, what we uh, started to do when we went remote and we've um, carried a lot of the software on um, and consider the, the continue to have a subscription. So that would um, include like things like Dreambox and uh, um, if Dr. Neil may know a couple of other names, I'm trying to remember them, um, my mind's drawing a blank, but 
it's, it's mainly instructional software for to help students uh, uh, in class and, in, and outside of the classroom. Okay, and we hadn't adjusted our budget for it. Cool. Right. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schlegman, do you have something? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, let me lower the hand. Okay, Any, anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Mason. We're all set to move on. Uh, superintendent's goals and formative assessment update, Dr. Holman. Okay, thank you. Let me share my screen. Um, I have a quick update for the committee as we had scheduled as part of our school committee presentation calendar uh, to just go over where I am with the progress towards my formative assessment, um, as well as to give you an improve, uh, an update on where I am relative to the goals and give the committee an opportunity to uh, discuss or think about how they want to present feedback um, to me. So I want to just give a quick overview of what the goals were and what the selected focus indicators were from the superintendent's rubric from the state of Massachusetts. Um, I had selected these focus indicators as areas that I was focused on in my uh, work in my first year as a superintendent and areas where I both felt that I had strengths and wanted to develop my practice as part of my professional practice goal. I identified three district improvement goals at the start of the school year. The first one was to build a collaborative and equity focused leadership culture for the district. Um, and the goals for that were to support time for leaders to learn together and calibrate expectations and to support uh, decision making on student level data and experiences. The second district improvement goal was to streamline transparency, family engagement and communication through processes that would include families in decision making and include their voices in the process of putting together plans and resources and communications that would be clear, timely, and easy to access. The third goal was to make sure that we could come back to school full time and maintain as um, regular of a school experience as possible and have students be in person. So uh, a safe and supportive pandemic return and recovery was a major goal with a reduction in the number of students who experience learning disruptions and need to be out of school as a result of the pandemic and a supportive post pandemic experience for our students and families. So I'm going to update you on where I am with the key action steps under each goal and uh, what I intend to provide you in January in terms of evidence and outcomes for the formative assessment. So um, for each of the actions, and I'm not going to read each slide to you because I don't think that's necessary, um, but for each of the actions, I've provided uh, an outline of where I am. If it says in progress, it means that it's ongoing. It probably will be throughout the course of the year. Some of these things might be fully completed by the end of the school year. Um, and in the formative evidence and outcomes for each of the action steps I had outlined at the start of the year, I provide what I anticipate will be prepared for you to review for the formative assessment in January. So these are materials I will compile over the next several weeks and give you the opportunity to review before our first meeting in January. Um, I believe it's our first meeting in January and then you will have the opportunity to give you feedback on those materials. Most of these action steps, here's goal two, are in progress. Um, so I have things that are sort of, um, I, you know, thus far as evidence, but maybe not totally completed, including artifacts from communications, the entry plan report that I will present to the school committee when we return in January, um, and any examples of work that has been done in any of these areas. Uh, one of the areas that has been completed is compiling the resources available to support pool testing and test and stay protocols. That's obviously still ongoing, but we have those resources available now in the district and we've expanded some of our nursing resources as we've gone along. And some of these data sets are pieces that have been available to you throughout our meetings as well, such as the school improvement plans, the dashboard, and some of the data on how we're doing relative to the pandemic. Um, and there's the professional practice goal. All of these are also still in progress and I'll provide a reflection memo on where I am with some of these tasks as part of my evidence as well. And the discussion before you tonight is really to ask any questions that you have, provide me with any input that you have on uh, data or evidence that you would like to see that I haven't listed uh, in the slides that were in your materials. Um, and to discuss how you would like evidence to be submitted by me to the committee and how you would like feedback to be provided to me, um, either through the chair or as individuals um, and any other comments or questions that you have. 
Before we start, is the format of the information that you get back, is that considered part of the permanent record? Yes. So the, the, it should, will this be treated the same way the summative is in a public forum? Yes. So and, uh, I guess, um, and uh, I'm opening the discussion, but I, I'm suggesting to the committee uh, what we've done in the past that you feed to the chair, the chair compiles it and it be presented. Uh, if anything else, uh, I'm hoping for other, any other suggestion. Dr. Ampey. What is, what, when, when you say that, I'm wondering what, what's the floor of what we need to do? I understand we could do more than that, but what's the minimum that we have to provide? I'll stand corrected, but uh, I understand that we have to respond as a committee, not as an individual, but as a committee to each of the uh, items that uh, has been listed as a goal and uh, react to how Dr. Uh, Holman presents uh, her evidence of uh, where she is at this moment or achieving it or where she's continuing to go. And is there a formal... There's um, no, as far as I know, there's no formal document for this. Okay, so it's not like the other one where we have the whole evaluation. I will look, I, is, is there a document? I don't think there's a document. Okay. Like the summative. Should we this, make it the, document? It be, pardon me? Should we make our own document? Six With different that? ones? Seven different ones? Is that what you're suggesting or? No, no, no. I'm saying one one document oh. that has all the different things on it and our response or something. Let's so that we each it. fill out the same thing. Okay. Jane? I So it's been a minute, but I thought that when we talked about this over the summer that we were going to provide some sort of narrative feedback in advance um, that we would, um, that would be part of the public, you know, be a part of the public record and that we would, um, that that, that that was what we were going to do at that time. If my memory serves, we were loath to provide any kind of numerical ranking or quantitative feedback of any kind that we would provide qualitative feedback that we would provide both in writing and during a meeting. But that's just what I remember, so I don't know. <laughs> Len, did you have your hand up? Okay, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Hanner. Uh, I think Ms. Morgan and Dr. Allison Ampey are both right. Um, <clears throat> we agreed not to do anything numerical, but I think we agreed that it would be good to have a common form that we use. I don't know if the committee needs to create that. I think the district leadership can just come up with something. I don't Dr. Think. Holman and I can yeah. Dr. Holman and I can come to, come up with something. We'll, we'll yeah, I, think I just want to come up with a form that we all use, and okay. it's a narrative. It's not numerical, and we just need to know the deadline when to get it to you. That's what. You know, I think we it's can work on this in the next week, can't we, Dr. Holman? Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that reasonable? No yeah. pressure. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that complicated. I don't think it's a complicated. Thing. All right, thank you. We all set on this. That was easy. Okay, moving on. Superintendent's report. All right, hold on a moment. Let me share my screen again. Okay. So here is our update with regards to where we are with uh, COVID cases in Arlington Public Schools as of this week. We um, are having a lighter week with COVID cases this week than we have over the past two, which is good news. We have not had as many cases that have um, reached the schools. We are, however, if you look at the town side um, statistics on the right of this slide, seeing a really significant uptick in cases per 100,000 in town. Um, so I want to continue to encourage everybody to take every precaution that you can 
We do not have concerns about transmission in our schools. Our protocols are working very well. And we do intend to pool test over the holiday uh, week next week. So we will be doing full pool testing next week. Um, big thanks to our nursing team who is adjusting timelines so that they can get all of the pool tests done before we need it in enough time for us to get the results back so that we can do the contact tracing that's required as a result of the pool testing. So they have needed to significantly shift, even though it's only a four day week, uh, we know the holiday is at the end of that week. So they've needed to significantly shift their timeline so that they can do the pool testing next week. But we're very glad that they can because we thought it was important from a public health standpoint that we give families the opportunity to be tested next week, given the rise in cases. Um, we are not in a position where we're considering any sort of relaxation of protocols or mitigation measures right now for January. And we have received information from the state and the commissioner um, that any determinations about whether or not mask mandates will be extended will be made later on in January and have not been determined yet. I also wanted to share with the community our current vaccination rates for Arlington Public School students. As you will see, um, some of our schools are well above the 80% mark, which is fantastic. Um, Arlington High School has 89% of their students vaccinated. This is showing any students who have received at least one shot. We do not have this percentage of students fully vaccinated yet, but when we get back in January, I'm going to adjust these statistics to only show those students who are considered fully vaccinated. We wanted to make sure that we were tracking our younger students as well who had went, who had gotten at least one shot or have gotten both um, shots, but may not be past that two week mark, which most of our students who were in our very earliest round of vaccinations will just be hitting in the next week or so. Um, we have very high rates and we're happy for that. And we're really hoping that we can get all of our schools above 80% or even better above the 90% mark in the next couple of weeks. Please consider having your children vaccinated, especially as we head into the holiday and winter seasons. A few other items to update everybody on. Um, first, good news that we had our Arlington High School winter concert last night, and it was a smashing success. Um, the musicians were there, everybody was masked, and we had a lovely audience, and the music was beautiful. The Arlington Education Foundation has also awarded the Arlington Public Schools a district vision and strategic planning grant. We partnered with Envision Arlington and would like to thank them as well for their partnership on developing the grant proposal for this grant. Um, an invitation for families and staff members and community members to apply to participate in the strategic planning team for Arlington Public Schools will go out in January and we're very much looking forward to an inclusive process uh, for developing a vision and mission, as well as strategic priorities for the Arlington Public Schools that will be supported by this grant. Uh, we were also awarded, this just came in yesterday, it was very exciting from Governor Baker's office, a teacher diversification pilot program grant. Um, for $42,000, uh, and this grant's going to support unlicensed Arlington Public School staff, particularly any staff who are our TAs or BSPs in the district, and who identify as individuals of color to acquire their professional license. We actually have a large number of educators in the Arlington Public Schools who are people of color in our um, TA and BSP positions, and we would love to have the opportunity to support them in getting a teaching license and staying with the school system. Um, we're very excited about that opportunity. Uh, we also want to uh, update you that we interviewed vendors today and we have more interviews to be conducted next week to conduct our equity audit, which was part of our ESSER 3 plan. Um, we began those today and we have a representative stakeholder committee that includes family members, students and staff uh, doing those interviews so that we can find the best possible person to conduct that audit for us. Um, I also wanted to address a message that went out to families earlier today about a TikTok and social media um, challenge or threat that has been making some nationwide news today. I want to emphasize what I emphasized in that message, which is that we have received absolutely no threats to Arlington's public schools. We do not have concerns about safety tomorrow, but because this is a national story and because other districts were messaging about what was going on, um, in this social media realm, we wanted to make sure that families were reassured that we were taking it seriously. We will be very vigilant during the day tomorrow, and we are increasing police patrol around our schools tomorrow as well. We uh, also, I wanted to update the committee because the question came up the last time we met that we have 36 open positions in the district. About nine of those are paraprofessional or TA positions. The others are 
um, professional positions. We do have special education openings and um, WBUR reported this week on pretty massive shortfalls in special education availability of staff, um, that there's a real staffing shortage in that area nationwide. And so we're seeing the impact of that in Arlington Public Schools as well. Um, when it comes to snow days, I've gotten this question a lot. So I thought I would go ahead and update everybody. Um, I think I said at a previous meeting that the kids are pretty unanimous about snow days, that we should have snow days. And the commissioner weighed in this week and he agrees. So we will be having snow days, not remote schooling days on days when it snows. But if we have a particularly challenging winter, uh, we will be in a position to consider remote days if the commissioner allows for it. But right now that's not a consideration and we will be having snow days which will be days to go outside and play in the snow and not be on your computer. Um, and you have your enrollment report as usual, and it doesn't show any significant changes since the last one that you received. And with that, I am done and I will take any questions from the committee. Anyone in the committee have any questions? Mr. Thielman. I just have two questions. Uh, thanks as always for the great report, Dr. Holman. My question is, so is there any, uh, strategy to fill these open positions? I mean, have you looked at anything? I mean, are, are there districts, have you talked to superintendents about doing something creative? I don't know what that would be, bonuses, signing, I'm not sure. Have you looked at anything? Um, we, so we've heard about creative solutions such mm -hmm. as um, signing bonuses. I think that those don't really attract uh, staff in the way that we might anticipate that they do. Uh, we have done things such as add uh, stipends to our nurses, all of them, not just one like a new position, but all of them. Um, and that has helped to attract into some of the positions that we've posted in mid-year. Um, I think what is also problematic about things like signing bonuses, first of all, um, legally and in terms of our relationships with our bargaining units, it's problematic because we have people who have been here with us through the entire pandemic and they would not be recipients of that, just the new people coming in. Um, so as a recruitment strategy, it's not one that we've really considered. Um, superintendents across the Commonwealth are having similar challenges. We have been able to fill several positions over the last um, couple of weeks, but we do have the, the few that remain open. Mr. Spiegel, are you on? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we have two of those positions that are listed were just filled today. Um, mm -hmm. The elementary math coach, which was a vacancy, um, and uh, the district-wide social worker position. I just spoke today to those, the two people who will be taking those positions. Um, and I am on, you know, the, our um, HR association in Massachusetts is actively, uh, has an active listserv and every district, all the HR directors in the state are having this issue of finding people looking um, at the, the Desi is, is, is trying to do things to publicize to our openings to candidates. Um, so, I mean, we're all sort of in the same boat. There is a, a, a real staffing shortage and we are trying um, everything, posting in different places and word of mouth and it's a challenge. Okay, I mean, it's a challenge for everybody everywhere, so. Yeah. Yeah. Ms. Keys. Um, I'm just putting, gonna put a plug in here. It's not gonna help with our like open, like our staff or permanent positions, but we are so desperately short on substitutes um, that like teachers are giving up prep time to cover classes just so we can keep buildings open at this point. If any college students are home and they're gonna be home through January, subbing is awesome. Kids are really fun to work with. The hours are pretty predictable. Um, especially if you wanna go into education, it's phenomenal experience. So like, please, please, please sign up and be a sub. <laughs> and we do have some college students who've reached out to me who we've added, who we're adding um, uh, now. Um, and we'll be starting um, some tomorrow, a couple tomorrow and, and through the next week. And then many of them have much of January off until they have to go back at the end of January. Um, and just so for anyone listening, um, to work in mass in any Massachusetts school, you do have to get fingerprinted. I just I it's a not a it's a quick process, but I can send whoever is interested that information, and we do require proof of COVID vaccination for staff. Ms. Elmer, 
Thank you. I, th I think it's probably hidden in the background of, of my, um, my, my white hand is hidden against the white background there. But um, I just wanted to add that we have used contract, we've been using agencies to fill many of our contracted positions, Mr. Thielman. So while, you know, we have posted vacancies because we're trying to hire permanent people, we have people in positions to cover um, uh, services at this point. Um, and We've been using contracted PTs to cover our um, physical therapist who's on their uh, her maternity leave. So we we are so some of those vacancies that you're seeing doesn't mean that there isn't somebody in that position at this moment because it's a contracted service and we're continuing to keep it open. I just wanted to let folks know that obviously that does come at a higher cost, which Michael um, Mason can probably um, share with you as as far as what we are paying these agencies. Um, and for whatever reason, they seem to have people who are not applying directly to the um, the positions that we are posting. Thank you very much. The the other question I had, uh, if I get one more question in, Mr. Hainer, uh, <clears throat> was some uh, people have reached out and wanted to know, wanted clarification about what the policy of the district is regarding um, masks in other words would what would the criteria be to get to a point where we no longer require masks i would say that that is a bit of a moving target one of the things we put in the re in the opening plan in the uh, recovery plan was a 90 percent bar that was because at the time we had a lot of uh, conversation around where would we place the bar and the state had not weighed in on that at that point they had not given us a metric and so we created our own metric uh, as part of the health and safety team and since then, the state has weighed in with a similar metric. They're not too far off from ours. And they've said 80% and you can apply for a waiver. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a good metric to work with. And it's also really important that we be in line with the town uh, health and human services department and what we're seeing. And if we are dealing with a more, at the time we were dealing with a very contagious Delta variant. Uh, variant. Uh, when we, are now dealing with and maybe even more contagious Omicron variant in the next month or two, the, and we're fully indoors and we need to be able to close the windows because it's too cold for the students to have the windows open. Um, we need to take that into consideration with everything else. And what I would also say is very important to keep in mind is that we need to be able to staff our buildings. And if you test positive for COVID-19 right now, you are out of the building for 14 days. And there's, there's no way around that. And if it is spreading in our schools, if we take masks off and it begins to spread in our schools and we have staff go out, we could be in a position where we need to close the school because enough staff are out sick that we can't staff it. Um, and that could be for an extended period of time because of how long somebody might need to be out with COVID-19. So while we are, while we would love to be in a position where we can begin to relax restrictions and while we know the impact that the masking can have on students' social engagement and on their ability to learn, uh, we need to take safety into consideration and make sure we can keep the buildings open. And so, yes, we the 80% line set by the state makes sense and we will follow the commissioner's guidance if he extends that um, mask mandate. That's something that we need to take into consideration and we're going to work with the Health and Human Services Department. No determination will be made absent all of those considerations. Thank you very much. Dr. Rampey. I just wanted to add that I hope we're also thinking about how we had some ventilation issues in certain places and that I, I think the masks are helping minimize the impact of those. Although I understand we're doing everything we can to make everything keep working, but these are mechanical devices and occasionally they don't. And uh, especially as we go into winter plus Omicron, it, it's, it, it gives us pause. Um, <clears throat> I also wanted to ask, I can't find exactly what I was looking for, but there was some concern that I heard from a parent that they were not, their student actually was a close contact and they were not identified by the contact testing or they weren't, I'm not sure if they weren't identified or if they weren't contacted. Um, and I don't, I certainly wouldn't want to provide more information publicly, but just are we able to identify? I mean, 
is this happening a lot? Are we identifying everybody? Are we having manpower problems? What, what's happening? So we identify any close contact and communicate with close contacts because there are expectations around close contacts in schools. Um, we, it, it does depend who they will be contact traced by, like who they are contacted by, depends on where the contact actually took place. It has to have taken place during school. If the contact took place outside of school, obviously they're going to be contacted by health and human services. Um, I do know that we had one occasion where we didn't immediately identify a close contact. We, we did identify that situation and then identify the close contact and communicate with that family. Um, in the event that a family feels as though they weren't contacted, um, they should definitely reach out to us and get clarification on what our procedure was because we identify all close contacts regardless of vaccination status. Great, that's really helpful, thank you. Great. Um, I, oh, so I think if you have COVID, I think the isolation is 10 days, not 14 days, um, but it's still a lot of days. Um, maybe it's 14 days and I'm wrong. Um, the question I had um, as a follow-up to, to Dr. Allison Ampies, it seems like um, this week in particular, we've had a hard time finding the positive cases in the pools. So there were five pools, but we only found, like we were only able to disaggregate down to one, which um, we've been doing, it, it just seems like it's a bad week, right? Like that we just haven't been able to find it, which happens. Um, what I was curious, and I couldn't find this anywhere, is what, it, what if any, are the protocols for notification if, no, if they don't find the case, right? So, like, so, and this happened to us this week. My daughter was in a positive pool. She was follow-up tested. It was negative. I didn't receive any communication, which makes sense. But now that I go and look at the dashboard, I think to myself, ew, <laughs> there were five pools, but only one of them we found the case. I wonder if she was in the four where we didn't find the case. And like, should I take her for a PCR test? Because like, maybe she has COVID and the Binax didn't find it. And I guess I was just curious if, if we had thought about like what the notification might look like in a situation where we have a test, a pool that comes back negative, but we're not able to find the case using the Binax testing. Um, I can, I can follow up with our health team on that. We don't currently, currently what we would do is retest them the following day to see if we identify the positive pool the following day. Often, um, or in these cases, like in that case, uh, we did not. So it's still the one and there, we didn't find a follow-up confirmed positive. And we have not been notifying if we aren't able to find the confirmed positive. Sometimes it'll show up in an next round of pool testing and then we'll be able to confirm the positive pool. Often that won't happen. So, or we'll, the family will have a PCR test separate because somebody becomes symptomatic and then we'll be able to confirm the positive pool. Um, depending on how many days out, we can't really confirm the positive pool was from that particular case because yeah. they are next. Uh, I can talk to the health team about what the capacity would be for notification in cases like this. We've had a surprising number of pools that have not been able to be confirmed this week. That's not typical. It seems like it. So it's, it doesn't, this doesn't seem like a very, this seems like a very, like a small problem, <laughs> I guess. So to me anyway, um, it's just interesting that, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting that we're not finding them with the Binax tests this week. Let's, let's hope that's not indicative of anything to come, but okay, great. And, you know, I just, the, the, the dashboard and the transparency of the data and information is, um, just, it's so appreciated. It, um, is so helpful. It's so self-service. <laughs> Um, and we can get so much good information from it. Um, and I'm, I appreciate it takes a lot of time 
um, to put something like this together. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm really grateful that we have it. So thank you, um, Dr. Holman. I know that you have a big hand in making this happen and you're standing on the shoulders of the giants who work um, in our nurses' offices, making sure that this, um, you know, that this testing is happening um, every week. And it's just, it's really, it's really important. And um, I'm proud that we're doing it. And it's certainly, uh, this is not the, you know, I, I, there are lots of districts that are testing, but not all of them. So um, it's great. Thank you so much. We have the best health team in the state, hands down. Mr. Flickman. Well, thank you very much. I want to circle back to the uh, issue of substitutes. Uh, I'm, I've been watching the Stratton School Parents Facebook feed, and there's one parent over there who decided to become a substitute and just is having a, a wonderful time doing it. And I just want to say that uh, if you are a parent and you're available during the day, uh, please consider doing this. You will find joy in working with the kids if you have it in your heart and soul to be a, a, a substitute and work with our kids. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing to do. Thank you. Well said. Okay, next item. First read, draft school committee regular meeting dates. Mr. Schlickman. Okay, we're doing this very early. Uh, uh, Ms. Diggins was looking to put together a district calendar, and I scrambled to do this quickly, uh, and uh, maybe a little too quickly, but I'm going to move presentation for first reading pursuant to the provisions of file BEA, the following dates for the school year 2022-2023 school committee meetings. And in 2022, it will be September 8th, September 22nd, October 13th, October 27th, November 17th, December 1st, and December 15th. And for 2023, uh, it would be January 12th and 26th, February 9th, March 2nd, 16th and 30th, April 13th and 27th, May 11th and 25th, and June 8th and June 22nd. Um, understanding that this is a first reading and that the dates that, that I'm proposing here follow the pattern of meetings that were engaged in this year and uh, I have checked for the date for the uh, MASC Delegate Assembly and Conference, and we are not in conflict if we adopt this schedule. So it is now before us as a first read. Uh, think about it, compare it to your own calendars, debate it, discuss it, and we'll come back at the next meeting and adopt it. We all have the opportunity going forward to add dates or change dates too. Uh, through a motion, just make. I just want to make sure everyone understands that. We yeah, those, are the, those are the twenty-one dates. Uh, Nineteen dates were required to right. schedule as regular meetings. We can add them. We can delete them at will. But we need to publish them right. uh, for our policy. Ms. Bogan, did you have a comment? Just the December fifteenth date needs to be twenty twenty-two, not twenty twenty-three, on the list. You no, know, uh, the, the years are off, so we'll get it all fixed for next year, for next meeting, which will be next year. It, it, you know, it's it's really hard to get the years right when we're this this far off. I have faith in you, Paul. You have a little trouble with your hand up and down, but other than that, you, you're doing a great job. Moving on, uh, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Warrant number 22126, $776,813.02. Stratton School Revised School Improvement Plan, 12-13-2021. School Committee Regular Meeting Minutes, November 18th, 2021. School Committee Regular Meeting Minutes, December 2nd, 2021. Do I have a motion to accept, uh, to approve? A move. Is there a second? Second. second. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. 
Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes. Uh, subcommittee liaison reports and announcements. Budget, Dr. Ampey. Nothing to report at this time. We'll be meeting again in the coming year. Community relations, Ms. Exton. Uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey and I had a uh, chat on Saturday. Um, it was a small group, um, but it went well. Curriculum instruction, assessment, and accountability, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we are meeting in early January. I don't have the date in front of me, but it'll be posted. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. We don't have a meeting, so no report. Policy and procedure, Mr. Schlickman. No report. Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. We had a very successful forum uh, last night uh, that we, I, we don't really know the attendance, but the link to the, uh, to the uh, uh, program is on the ACMI website. I don't know if it's on the Arlington School, on the Arlington High School Building Committee website, but it's on the ACMI website. People can watch it. And uh, Dr. Holman reported afterwards that about 30 plus, 35 or so uh, people have used the uh, translation channels for, for uh, ASL, Portuguese, Spanish, Mandarin, Japanese. Mm -hmm. I think I've got them all. So that was nice to see. And on top of that, about 36 additional viewers in English. Yes. Any liaison reports at this time? Any announcements? Any future agenda items? Okay, seeing none. Uh, executive, we will be entering executive session and Mr. Spiegel, it's my understanding we will not be returning to open meeting? Yeah, I don't know if it's, it's not on the agenda for an open meeting vote, so no. Okay, uh, to executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel a contract negotiation with union and or non-union, which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or in litigation, which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Uh, I will entertain a motion uh, to go into executive session. So moved. Second. A second. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Dr. Rampey. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. And I vote yes. So moved. 